My name is Laura Lieber, and I'm the director of the Duke Center for Jewish Studies. And on behalf of the center, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our fall 2017 Rudnick Lecture. The Rudnick Lecture endowed by Mr. David Rudnick and devoted to the topic of Israel and world affairs is our most prestigious public event. Previous speakers in the series have included Shimon Peres, the former Prime Minister and President of Israel, <laughs> David Ellenson, now Chancellor Emeritus of Hebrew Union College, Arnold Eisen, Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Ambassador David Ross, Isaac Herzog of Israel's Labor Party, Jonathan Sachs, former Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the United Kingdom, and Nobel Laureate Elie Wiesel. Tonight, we are honored to add Yossi Kleinha-Levy to this illustrious roster of guests. Yossi Klein Halevi is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. At the Hartman Institute, he co-directs the Muslim Leadership Initiative with Duke's own Abdullah Hantepli. Brooklyn-born and the son of a Holocaust survivor, Halevi received a BA in Jewish Studies from Brooklyn College, a degree in Journalism from Northwestern University. He first visited Israel in 1967 and lived there since, has lived there since 1982, although his career as a writer, editor, an intellectual activist is almost literally without borders. I will at present just briefly introduce you to a few of his books in case this visit should cause you to desire to explore his works further. His latest book, like Dreamers, the story of the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation, published in 2013, won the Jewish Book Council's Everett Family Foundation Jewish Book of the Year Award. His 2001 book, The Entrance to the Garden of Eden, A Jew's Search for God with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land, also received tremendous acclaim. Cynthia Ozick called it a permanent masterwork, while Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, called it extraordinary and heartbreaking, a book full of wonders. Halevi's first book, Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist, The Story of a Transformation, published in 95, told the story of his teenage attraction to and subsequent disillusionment with the Jewish militancy of Mayor Kahana. The New York Times called that book a book burning with importance, a recognition underscored by its recent reissuance in paperback. <clears throat> so, Yossi Klein Halevi has been active in Middle East reconciliation work and serves as chairman of Open House, an Arab Israeli, Jewish Israeli center in the town of Ramla near Tel Aviv. He was one of the co found one of the founders of the now defunct Israeli Palestinian Media Forum, which brought together Israeli and Palestinian journalists. We are delighted to welcome him to Duke this evening. He is joined tonight, as you can see, this is not a conventional lecture, by Duke's own professor of public policy and political science, Bruce Gentleson. Professor Gentleson, a leading scholar of American foreign policy, has served in a number of US policy and political positions. From 2009 to 2011, he served as senior advisor to the US State Department policy plan, as policy planning director. In 2012, he served on the Obama um, Campaign National Security Advisory Steering Commission. In 2015 and 16, he was the Henry Kissinger Chair of Foreign Policy and International Relations at the John W. Kluge Center, the Library of Congress. He's also served as a Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. And he served on a number of policy commissions, including the Responsibility to Protect R2P. Is this? Okay. Um, working group co-chaired by Madeleine Albright. Professor Gentleton has held positions as is a distinguished scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and is a Fulbright Scholar in Spain, as well as appointments at the Brookings Institution, Oxford University, and Australian National University. He has consulted with the Carnegie Commission for Preventing Deadly Conflict, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Assembly and the Atlantic Council, and the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the U.S. Institute for Peace. These brief and inadequate, this brief and inadequate precy of Professor Gentleson's career, which neglected, unlike my first introduction, um, all of his scholarly publications, fails to do him justice, but indicates, however briefly, what a remarkable person we are able to claim as our colleague here and what an appropriate dialogue partner for Yossi klein -Halevi. Finally, tonight's discussion will be moderated by our own Imam Abdullah Antepli, a treasured colleague who also co-directs the Muslim Leadership Initiative with Yossi Klein Halevi. Imam Antepli is Chief Representative of Muslim Affairs at Duke University and Senior Fellow at the Duke Office of Civic Engagement. 
a pioneer in advocating for the robust and organic presence of Muslims on college campuses, among other locations. Imam Antepli is the founder and executive board member of the Association of College Muslim Chaplains and a board member of the Association for College and University Religious Affairs. He came to Duke University as our first Muslim chaplain in 2008, and through his current work here, Imam Antepli engages students, faculty, and staff across and beyond the campus through seminars, panels, and other avenues. He works tirelessly, and I do mean tirelessly, I've never seen him tired, to bring a Muslim voice and perspective to the discussions of faith, spirituality, social justice, and more. Imam Antepli serves as a faculty member in the Duke Divinity School, teaching a variety of courses on Islam and Muslim traditions and cultures, and he's a pioneering figure in interreligious dialogue for reasons that will become <coughs> evident, as well as a figure of kindness, humor, integrity, passion, and eloquence. I cannot imagine a more heartening and enlivening panel to hear this evening. Thank you very much. Amen. It is a distinct pleasure and honor to welcome my brother, my partner in crime. He and I have been working very, very close in the last five, six years in a variety of projects, but especially Muslim Leadership Initiative, and my dear colleague, uh, Bruce Gentleson. I request that these two distinguished speakers to first give maybe 10 minutes or so preliminary remarks, and I will start out asking a few questions to them, and then we will open up to the audience. Does that sound good? Okay. Please join me in welcoming Yossi Klein Halevi. I'm just delighted, really delighted to be here for several reasons. One is that I'm at the very end of a five-week lecture tour, and I'm going home. <laughs> and, uh, and more to the point, uh, this is really a, a, an opportunity and a, a privilege to be at the, at the academic and, and spiritual home of my, my partner, my imam, my brother, mm -hmm. Abdullah, and uh, with all of the work that we've done over the years to really come here to the place that, that has given him the, the intellectual and spiritual home uh, that he deserves is, uh, is really an honor. So thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, uh, Laura, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And, and <coughs> Professor Gentleson, I'm delighted to be your partner, your conversational partner for the evening. In assessing the increasingly strained relationship between Israel and American Jewry, I think we need to take a step back and place the relationship in its proper historical context. And that is that our generation is heir to the most successful resurrection in Jewish history. And that resurrection happened simultaneously in Israel and in the United States. Israel is the strongest expression of Jewish sovereignty in history. And I, I, I include the Davidic kingdom. I believe that, that the, the power, the influence that the state of Israel has today on the world scene is unmatched in terms of Jewish sovereignty in our history. And in terms of contemporary American Jewry, this is the most powerful, most successful, most self-confident diaspora that we've ever experienced. And what makes this moment so extraordinary in Jewish history is that both of these experiments emerged simultaneously. If either had, been, had emerged separately, uh, either would have been celebrated by Jews as, as, as miraculous, as an answer to our deepest prayers. And for both of these, these experiments to emerge uh, virtually at the same time uh, really has created unimagined opportunities for Jewish life. Opportunities that we have not yet begun to explore. These are two very different and entwined experiments in Jewish life. In Israel, we are, for the first time in, in, in several thousand years, uh, essentially on our own in shaping our public space, in determining the nature of, uh, of Jewish culture, of Judaism, whether we've done a, a good job or not, I, uh, I will leave perhaps for our conversation. And in the United States, 
the Jewish minority is not only tolerated in the public space, but is welcomed to bring its values and its interests into the, the public conversation. There has never been a, a minority situation for Jews in which, in which Jewish values and interests have been so solicited, so much a part of the public space of the host country as, uh, as American Jews experience. Uh, in, in, in a sense, I think that the, the innovation of American Jewry in, 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 Jewish, in, in historical terms is the introduction of the radical notion of Jews by choice. Now, Jews by choice was a term that was initially applied to converts. Uh, I, I think that we can extend that term to all American Jews because American Jews today are, are essentially all Jews who have a choice of how far to acculturate, uh, how far to, to maintain their Jewishness. And I don't believe we've ever had that kind of freedom uh, in our history before. And so the, the challenge and the, the, the opportunity for American Jewry is to create a, a self-sustaining Judaism that is not dependent on external threat, uh, on ghettoization. And this really is a, a, a precious moment in, uh, in Jewish history. The strain that we are increasingly experiencing in the relationship uh, is, uh, is due to developments uh, on both sides of the relationship. On the Israeli side, we've just recently marked 50 years to the Six Day War, uh, which in Israel was rightly celebrated as, uh, as 50 years to, to the moment when uh, modern Israel was effectively born, when the state we know today emerged, when Israel successfully defeated an attempt uh, to destroy it, and yet 50 years is also the, the commemoration of, uh, of a half century of Israel ruling over another people and all of the moral complexity and, and I would say tragedy involved in, uh, in, in, in that dilemma. And at the same time, we are increasingly aware of how uh, the ongoing Israeli uh, refusal to come to terms with the Jewish religious pluralism as expressed in the diaspora uh, is increasingly uh, creating alienation and I would add justifiable anger uh, against, against Israel in the diaspora. On the American Jewish side of the relationship, uh, I, would, I would fault uh, an increasing inability on the part of many American Jews to come to terms with Israel's vulnerability. Uh, one can be powerful as Israel is and still be vulnerable. Uh, and I, I, I think that the, the tremendous gap in, in, in our experience in Israel of living with constant terrorism, siege, uh, and the American Jewish experience of safety uh, has created a, a certain failure of imagination on the part of many American Jews who don't understand what it means to, uh, to live with the kind of, of threat that Israelis live with on a daily basis. And the, this, this, this gap in experience is, is intensified by the increasingly asymmetrical relationship between the two communities uh, to uh, military service. Uh, in Israel, of course, the military <coughs> is thoroughly integrated uh, into, uh, into Israeli life. Civilian and military Israel are often entwined. Israel is a thoroughly militarized society. I, would, I don't say militaristic. It is not that. It can become that. Uh, it, is not, it is not at this point militaristic. Uh, civilian Israel impacts on military Israel as much as military Israel impacts on civilian Israel. Uh, but, but the fact remains that the military is central to our national and cultural experience. Uh, this is the first generation of American Jews 
uh, maybe since the Revolutionary War, that lacks military experience almost completely. I grew up in this country uh, during the <coughs> Vietnam War. My generation was probably the first, uh, not just American Jews, but generally, my, my generation of Americans, was really the first to, to rebel against, against uh, military culture, no participation in the military. Nevertheless, it was still normative for young American Jews to go to the military, or if not the military, then the Coast Guard to try to get out of service in Vietnam. But there was still some organic relationship between the American Jewish community and the military in this generation it's virtually disappeared and I believe that has uh, long-term consequences for the ability of American Jews and Israelis to speak the most minimal shared language even when we're speaking together in English. The opposite geographical circumstances that American Jews and Israelis experience um, has created a built-in strain into the relationship, which is really unavoidable. Uh, you live in the safest diaspora as in Jewish history, and Israelis live in the most dangerous region on the planet, not just for Israelis, but I would argue for, for anyone in the Middle East. As a result of our very different geographical <clears throat> experiences, American Jews and Israelis have devised opposing strategies for coping. American Jews have, by necessity, become flexible, open to their society. And Israelis have become, the effectively, the toughest kid in the neighborhood. The irony, or the paradox for Israel, is that the more we act in a manner that ensures our relative safety in the Middle East, which is to say the tougher we act in the Middle East, the more vulnerable we become in the liberal West, the more our position, our status becomes undermined. The very acts that ensure our relative safety in the Middle East undermine our position in the liberal West. And most American Jews live in politically in that space in liberal America. The question then is how do we navigate what seems to be a, a, a growing and perhaps uh, inevitable divide? And I would propose briefly uh, two approaches and then, and then pass on the conversation. First of all, we need to strengthen the political center in American Jewry. In Israel, and this is really not sufficiently appreciated in the American Jewish community, Israel is no longer divided as it once was in the 80s and especially the 1990s between two more or less equally powerful camps, an ideo ideological left and an ideological right. Today, we have an the emergence of a strong center. Uh, I would go so far as to say that a majority of Israelis today are to one extent or another centrist on the Palestinian issue. And by that I mean that, that Israelis, uh, centrist Israelis agree with the left that the occupation is, uh, is untenable uh, and at the same time agree with the right uh, that peace is, uh, uh, is unattainable at least for the foreseeable future. And so, put another way, centrist Israelis believe that a Palestinian state is an existential necessity for Israel, on the one hand, and potentially an existential threat at the same time. Put yet another way, and I would say this as a centrist, uh, I have two <coughs> nightmares about a Palestinian state. The first nightmare is that there won't be a Palestinian state, the status quo continues indefinitely, and Israel finds itself in the impossible situation of having to choose between its two essential identities as a Jewish state and a democratic state. And my second nightmare is that there will be a Palestinian state, and we will find ourselves in a position where we may not be able to defend ourselves. Israel is the only occupier that I can think of, certainly in modern times, that, that worries 
that withdrawal from territory will not merely diminish it, but could lead to a situation where it may not be able to adequately defend itself. And so the dilemma of a centrist is that we are, centrists are simultaneously left wing and right wing, uh, which is to say that we have internalized the left right divide so that it's happening inside of each of us. I have mornings when I wake up and it's a left wing morning. Uh, and I tell myself, whatever we do, we have to just get out. Even unilaterally, rockets will fall, we'll deal with it. And I have other mornings when I wake up and I say to myself, are you out of your mind? What do you think will happen when we leave the West Bank? A poll was taken of Israelis recently asking that question. 67% responded, Hamas will take over. I was surprised that, that, that the numbers were so low because I think, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fair assumption that Hamas will, in fact, take over. And so what I, as an Israeli, need from American Jews uh, are partners in complexity, partners in anguish, partners who will understand just how wrenching the dilemmas facing Israel really are. The second and final point is um, in terms of how to navigate the relationship, is that we need to strengthen our cultural and spiritual conversation so that we are not only focused on the political issues. Uh, and that means nurturing different forms of Judaism in Israel that are beginning to emerge, uh, forms of indigenous forms of Judaism that are outside of the Orthodox establishment's control. And most of all, it means learning how to appreciate the different forms of Judaism that are emerging in both communities. And I sometimes think of, of the relationship culturally between, between Israelis and American Jews as a almost, if. If, if the relationship were working the way it should be, we would be, each would be experiencing something of the other's uh, unique experience. For American Jews, it's the experience of width, and for Israelis, it's the experience of depth. And I'll just say a word about what I mean and conclude with that. The American Jewish experience of width is that anything and everything is possible in a Jewish framework. You have opened up Judaism in ways that has never been opened before. Uh, Israelis do have a strong relationship with their Jewish identity, but they don't feel that sense of joy and possibility generally in Judaism that many American Jews do. In fact, the notion of Judaism as being a, a, um, a joyful experience tends to be, tends to be fairly strange to, uh, to Israelis. Uh, Israelis don't feel that they own their Judaism. More often, we feel owned by Judaism. And so there's something in that, in that expansiveness of the American Jewish experience that we in Israel, I think, desperately need. We need to learn from your experiments and from the courage of American Jews in, in owning their Judaism and experimenting with it. Where I think American Jews can learn from Israelis uh, is in the sense of the depth, the seriousness of, uh, of the Jewish experience. In Israel, Jewishness can often mean life and death, quite literally. And when I think of the depth of, of the Israeli Jewish experience, the image that I have is of a, of a well, uh, and a well that goes very deep through, through thousands of years. Uh, but a well can also be, a well is narrow and dark. And a well needs light and expansiveness. And so that is the, the transfusion of depth and width is something that I believe American Jews and Israelis can offer each other if the relationship can work properly. Thank you very much. So I also want to start by uh, thanking my colleague, Laura Lieber, for a wonderful introduction, the kind that if my mother were here, she would tell you all the flaws that go with it, but uh, but she would enjoy hearing it as well. And, um, it's a pleasure to 
share an evening with Yossi. We've never met before, but I've read his work um, with great regard and great respect uh, for many years and many outlets. Uh, and um, we may not agree on everything, but, I, but I've always felt I could learn something from reading it. And my colleague Abdallah, who it's always a pleasure to, to do work for. And they briefly mentioned the kind of work they've been doing on reconciliation. Uh, between Muslim and Jewish communities, which is really quite extraordinary and a great personal risk. Uh, um, um, and, and I think they're to be commended for that and hope they'll continue doing that. Um, it reminded me of my own sort of favorite way of conveying the possibilities of reconciliation between Israelis uh, and their neighbors. Um, Israel and Jordan signed peace treaty in 1994, still holds. And uh, I have a very, very dear friend who is an Israeli who came over here to the United States. We're, we did our PhDs together at Cornell. And we've, been, we've done the same kind of work. Our families are very close over the years. And he was, he's been a very high-ranking Israeli official in foreign policy and national security. And he was particularly working in the 1990s with the Jordanians. And people remember in the Gulf War of 1990, Jordan sided with, briefly at least, with Saddam. And the United States stopped providing uh, parts and other assistance for the military equipment they've been providing. And then after the peace treaty, we reopened it. Um, but they kind of needed help from the Israelis to learn how to you know, fly these F-15s and others. And, and this friend of mine um, had developed a close relationship with the uh, head of the Air Force in Jordan. They were going back and forth and working together and everything. And he shows up in Amman one day, and General Marouf, who later went on to be Prime Minister of Jordan, says to my friend Eli, um, uh, as a token of our friendship, I have something for you. And a Jordanian officer comes in the room and opens a box, and there's a red Jordanian Air Force tie. And Ellie says, he says, I really appreciate this. You know, we Israelis, we only wear ties. You know, we have to go to Washington or something, he says. But my mother gave me two ties for my birthday the other day, and, and I wore one to her house on Shabbat. Uh, and he said, and I was very proud of myself, and, and she looked at me, and she, and, and she turned to me because there had been two ties. She said, what's the matter? Don't you like the other one? <laughs> at which point, General Maroof says something in Arabic, and his aide comes out and comes back in with a blue Jordanian Air Force <laughs> and says, now you're going to have the same problem with, your, with me as you have with your mother. Uh, so it's an essence of, of the kind of relationships that, that, can, that can be built. Um, I thought I'd make my comments along two lines, uh, really as a compliment to, to Yossi's. One are issues in Israel that affect us as American Jews. Um, and secondly, perhaps more secular policy issues in Israel that affect us as Jewish Americans. Uh, and, and I think we share the view that the relationship uh, is deep, uh, is extremely important to all. It's not more important to Israel than it is to us. Uh, and it has uh, various kinds of tensions and problems. We may not agree totally on the sources of them and, and, and what to do with them. Uh, I've never lived in Israel. I've been going back and forth since probably the 1980s, both for my own work, working on these issues and my policy capacity, uh, and also uh, out of personal relationships. Um, I did not go for my bar mitzvah. My mother gave me the choice. My parents gave me the choice of that or a fancy, a relatively fancy New York par party. And the infinite wisdom of a 12-year-old, you know what I chose. I chose the party. Uh, we did not give our son that choice. And his first trip to Israel was part, at least, of his bar mitzvah. Um, but there are issues, I think, that are, that in Israel that, that are causing concern among, among American Jews. And Yossi mentioned them. Let me mention a couple, my own perspective of those, and maybe some others. I mean, I, I think when you look at, for example, the fight over equitable access to the Western Wall, uh, which has been um, uh, in the news a lot lately. Uh, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the president of the Union for Reform Judaism, uh, bitterly called what was being offered to, um, uh, to non-Orthodox Jews and to women in particular a few little crumbs. Uh, and I think this is an important issue for many American Jews. I, I would almost bet that anybody in this room who's particularly Jewish, not necessarily only Jews, their first trip to Israel, they made sure to include the Western Wall. Uh, I was there a few years ago. It's a program I'm involved with called Academic Exchange, where we bring professors to Israel from all over the world. And I had three Chinese colleagues with me. And we took them on, on Shabbat Eve to, um, to the Western Wall. And it was fascinating, because they saw everything going on, the people dancing, the people dressed differently. And in a very you know, Chinese way, they turned to me and said, you all believe in the same thing. Why aren't you doing the same thing? Uh, and it's kind of an interesting perspective to get on it from, um, uh, from Chinese. But I think this is a real issue 
for many American Jews, both in itself and, and what it stands for in terms of the sense of not sufficient tolerance for reform, conservative, reconstructionist Jews in Israel, and increasingly less tolerance. Um, similarly, on the ultra-Orthodox control um, of conversions. Um, there's a bill now to tighten the control over conversions, um, um, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, who had made some commitments, I think, to uh, uh, representatives of the American Jewish community, uh, has delayed a vote on the conversion bill for another six months, uh, possibly next month in December. It will come up for a vote. Uh, this has to do with the coalition politics in Israel, Israel now, uh, which, you know, in some ways is understandable. We have our own uh, partisan politics, too, to say the least. Uh, but I think it's a real issue. Uh, and there is a sense that the power of the small Orthodox and particularly ultra parties uh, to, you know, exert their power on issues that not only affect life among American Jews, they actually affect life among Israelis and, and, men, and many secular Israelis. Um, this friend of ours who lives in Ramat Hasharon outside of Jerusalem, you know, when we would visit, we'd go for these long walks on the beaches of Herzliya and have these long conversations uh, about a variety of things. Uh, last time we were there, we actually, you know, had to stop our walk because the barriers were up where people from the settlements and elsewhere, the uh, ultra orthodox were coming in and using the beaches. Um, it's not that they shouldn't have access to the beaches, but even in the Tel Aviv area, and you talk with people, you're beginning to have a sense of the tensions between the secular and the religious. Military service is a huge issue, a huge issue. All three children of this friend of ours have served two women and one men, and at least two of them re-up for second terms. Uh, and, and I think the, the tensions there, as well as the budgetary issues, um, are affecting Israeli life. I'll come back to that in a second as it relates to some broader political issues. Um, so I think these are of great concern to, to American Jews. And, and while it is not our country, there, there's a real, a real concern about how they affect our own sense of Judaism and, frankly, relationship to, to Israel. I think my biggest concern is for the younger generation. So I also grew up learning about the 67 war uh, and the heroism of the war and the very real threats of being surrounded by countries sworn to, to, to the destruction of the state of Israel. Uh, and that was the context. I, I didn't have immediate family that survived the Holocaust, but I had family that you know, had suffered all sorts of other things. Uh, I'm a big believer in the birthright program. I think it's an incredible experience for young people. Again, when we were there for, with our son, um, when he was 13, and we were driving around with these friends of ours, and we were going up somewhere to the north, to the Canara, and, and uh, um, uh, women were in one car, the men in the other, and we had my son and his son, and he stopped and, it was, and, and picked up a soldier who was headed back for the weekend, you know, for, for leave, for, for Shabbat, and, you know, had his Uzi over his arm, sticking in the back seat, and Ellie and this soldier, were, they, they switched to Hebrew, and they were in this very intense discussion, you know, going on and on and on, and when he gets out, uh, our son Adam says, Ellie, what were you guys fighting about? He said, oh, we weren't fighting, we agreed. And Adam <laughs> then learned the, the notion of heated agreement among Israelis. You know? <laughs> so to go there as a young person is extremely important. I think Birthright does this not only for American Jews, we've seen Brazilian Jews and other Jews there. But I know for this generation as a professor and working with a lot of students, Jewish and otherwise, that when I was growing up, your sense of international uh, was really very much about Israel or about Vietnam. Uh, and so you had a real sense of your interest in things international, you really thought a lot about Israel. Our young people today have a range of interests in things international. They may go through Duke Engage or other programs to you know, teach English in Botswana, or they may go to Fight A's or work on building water wells in Guatemala or somewhere to Thailand. And you know, for many of them, I won't speak for all of them, but for many of them, they haven't had the same bonding experience that previous generations had with Israel. Indeed, they may have some real ambivalences. I'm not talking about BDS or anything like that, but the ambivalences of thinking about how important Israel is to them, but also some of the issues that are raised uh, by the occupation and a variety of other things. And so I really worry about their identification for Israel as they go forward, whether one thinks of fundraising uh, and, and that, or political support. And I think it's a really important issue because it's, it's very different 
And um, again, it's not so much that they're pro-Palestinian, that's its own issue. It's that their sense of connection with Israel formed at a young age is not the same. Um, I guess I also have to say um, that for me, um, you know, one of the extreme um, periods I had uh, was the killing of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin being justified by a number of rabbis in Israel uh, in religious terms. There's plenty to disagree about on the peace process. Josie and I already discovered we have some disagreements on, on, the, on the Oslo process. Um, but when uh, one settler told the Israeli Defense Force uh, that if they came to evict them from the settlements that, quote, they would be resisted as if they were soldiers of the Third Reich, uh, there were posters of Rabin with a Hitlerian mustache, uh, and the invocation of doctrines of, I pronounce it right, Din Mosher and Din Rozef, uh, justifying the killing of someone who delivered it to Jews. So the notion that religion was used there really, um, I found very painful. Uh, um, um, and I think it, that was 1995, and I think many of those aspects uh, have, have, have been exacerbated in the 20 plus years since. In terms of the um, Jewish American issues, um, the question of the vulnerability of Israel that Yossi raises, I, I agree with very much. When you go to Israel as a government official, the first time you go, they take you on the helicopter ride. And some of you may have done this. You get on a helicopter in Tel Aviv, and you go up to the border of Golan, you go along the border of, of, of the old Green Line, you go down to Gaza, uh, and you're back in Tel Aviv for lunch. There is an inherent security dilemma that Israel has, truly like no other country in the world. Uh, some of that has been helped by peace with Egypt, which has now lasted for, what, almost 40 years. Ups and downs, cold peace, but it has held. Um, and peace with Jordan. Um, but it still is the most dangerous neighborhood in the world. But I think that there is, and I remember at the graduate, the um, military officer school graduation of this friend of ours, oldest daughter, her grandparents, who were really there for the founding of the state, turned to my wife Barbara and I, and they said, we're so proud of Sharon today. You know, she's graduated from officer school. But wouldn't it be great if there's a day where her children don't have to serve? Uh, and it was, it was a wish of Israelis. And I think they're realistic to know that, that that's not likely to happen. Uh, anytime soon. Um, but I think one can also have views about the way that certain policies of the Israeli government have made their security situation worse. Uh, and here I think that, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that American, that we in the United States totally live in a comfortable neighborhood. I think people can have a real appreciation for what the issues are and, and feel uh, concerns about the policies. Um, in my work, which has put me in touch with, both in friendships and professional work with uh, many military officers, uh, intelligence chiefs, former heads of the Mossad, um, one of them once said to me that, and this is a little bit like the two dreams and two nightmares, there is no guarantee that peace will, the Palestinians will bring us security. But there is no way we will ever have security without peace with the Palestinians. There's a website called Commanders for Israel Security that you can go to that has something like two or three hundred former military officers, former high-ranking people in the Mossad and the Shin Bet, the other intelligence services, who really push hard because they believe that however hard it is today, it's harder tomorrow. And we can talk about that going back to Camp David 1978. We surely can talk about that going to the to the um, peace process. And we may get into some of this more in the discussion. I think it was one of the mistakes, frankly, that many people in Israel made and, and in the American Jewish community about the Obama administration, of which I was a part. Uh, and there were many policies, there were some policies that I, I didn't personally agree with. Uh, but I think there was a sense of, you know, uh, uh, sh where, where Israel and the United States interests were convergent, the, the Obama administration was as supportive, if not more than any other. The $38 billion 10-year deal that was signed at the end of the Obama, Obama administration or military intelligence cooperation was a larger amount of money than ever before. There were honest differences over Iran and the Palestinians. Uh, there were honest differences. I don't think they were biased. I don't think they were prejudiced. I don't think they were hatred. And I think that from an American point of view, it's true. I can't understand fully this sense of existential vulnerability uh, of living in Israel, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis terrorists or vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, but I can try to do my best, as many of my colleagues can, and I can still feel that I come out in a, in a different place that allows me to say to Israelis, in the spirit of 
maybe heated disagreement sometimes, uh, that yes, I care about your security, but no, I, I have a difference on certain policies. And so I think living with this is going to be important. Uh, I don't think it's changing. I don't think it was specific to an administration. You can go back through the history of U.S.-Israel relations and see many areas of disagreement in the Reagan administration, the Bush administration. And I think how we deal with this in ways that allow us to disagree but keep coming back to the shared objective is really one of the challenges we have uh, as Jewish Americans uh, and as Israelis. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Adon. Thank you. Thank you very much. The relationship are strained, and uh, some would even argue that it's, uh, it's damaged and deteriorating very rapidly, especially with the generational breakdown. I wonder, um, in addition to all the, one, all the important obstacles or causes of this deterioration that you outlined, there is also one issue as important as what you have already mentioned here, both for both of you, is apathy, especially among the younger generation of uh, American Jews, um, neither the Zionism of crisis, none of the existential threats that Israel is uh, facing uh, is, is not convincing, not compelling, nor the Zionism of longing um, for many American Jews to imagine their Judaism uh, independently and disconnected from Israel. That religious argument, spiritual argument, or racial argument is not working anymore for a lot of younger, um, younger American Jews. Their American identity and their, their imagination, they imagine to be an American Jew independent from Israel. Uh, just recently I met somebody who went, came back from birthright and he said, I went, I saw, I'm not interested. I am just not interested. Uh, in his or her Americanness, he or she can imagine a world um, completely in America in whatever way he or she feels that way. What do you think? Uh, is maybe some of the deterioration is caused by what's happening in the United States with the new generation. Do you think there's a, there's a value in discussing this a little bit more? You'll see first and then. We actually agree on more than, uh, than, than we thought initially, but uh, it would be interesting to play out where we disagree. I, in terms of uh, the alienation, I think it's, it's a result of, uh, of success on the one hand and a failure on the other. Uh, the success is that Israel is no longer uh, existentially threatened. It is vulnerable. It, it, is, uh, often, uh, it often feels living in Israel uh, that we are uh, on the verge of, uh, of war at any moment. But I think most Israelis know, uh, have, have the confidence that we'll be able to handle whatever uh, security situation uh, presents itself, and the, really the only question for, for Israel today is, is how much of a price we'll have to pay for, for ensuring our, our security. And so, you know, from, for, for my generation of American Jews, the generation of 1967, 1973, the question was really existential. Can, will, will Israel survive? And so the, the I would say the neutralization of that of that anxiety uh, has has created a shift in the relationship. Uh, I remember growing up in a sense of, of with a sense of urgency about about Israel. It was also very close to the Holocaust. I mean, it was the 1960s and 70s. I just recently did the calculation of uh, of, of how far we are today from the Holocaust or from the Six Day War. For me, growing up in the 60s. That was World War One, you know. It's it's and World War One was was ancient history. It was before World War Two. <laughs> so, uh, and and so there's a an understandable lessening of the significance for Israel in the sense of Israel's existence. And there was also the sense after the Holocaust that that was that was overwhelmingly true for my parents' generation. And, and true as well for, for our generation, uh, which was the, the miracle of Jewish power. Jewish policemen, Jewish soldiers, this was a great novelty. And, and it is a sign of the maturation of Israel, the maturation of the American-Jewish-Israeli relationship, that we're no longer excited by, by, by Jewish soldiers. This is something that we, we, take, we take for granted. And, and you know, again, for my generation, there was this sense of, of 
we needed to prove that Jews could fight. I, I remember uh, <laughs> books in my, in my home with titles like Jews Fight to Exclamation. <laughs> and, and today, if anything, the perceived problem is that Jews fight too well. And so this, this, this sense of, of the need to kind of nurture and protect Israel has, has lessened. And, and that's a sign, I celebrate the, the, the lessening of anxiety uh, for Israel. Uh, on the other hand, the failure is really to what you alluded to, Abdullah, which is there, there are, Zionism is really a, a meeting point of need and longing. And American Jewry did the Zionism of need very well. And when the Zionism of need became less urgent, the Zionism of longing somehow was, was absent. And, and what we need to recreate in the relationship, and this is true in Israel as well, is, is something of the Zionism of longing. And what does that mean? What does it mean to retain a sense of, if not longing, because how, how do you long for what's been fulfilled? But not everything has been fulfilled by, by a long shot. And so what is it in our relationship to 2,000 years of longing? First of all, that we need, we need to retain an appreciation for that longing and how we, we're sustained by that longing. And also, what is it in that longing that we still need to carry? What has not been fulfilled that we still need to be actively longing for? And that, perhaps, is a basis for a new way of thinking of the relationship, a shared longing for the kind of Israel that we all want to see. I actually believe that most young Jewish Americans want to feel connected to Israel. Now, it may not be as big a part of their consciousness as a different generation, for the reasons Josie said, it's, you know, some of that's ancient history, the, the range of choices. But I think they do, and I think they run into this confusion and ambivalence about it. And some of it, I think, is not even just the political issues. It is the secular religious, right? And because they tend to be, you know, especially at a young age, you know, they may go to Shul on Rosh Hashanah, but they tend to be more into their secular lives. So I think those are real challenges uh, that, you know, that have to be met. And it's very important because I think everybody benefits, uh, even if it's not as an extensive a part of their life as they grow up, you know, intersect with things going on in American society about, you know, percentages of people that actually belong to congregations and a whole variety of other things. So. Um, you know, those are societal forces. Some of those forces would be there even if everybody loved Israeli politics then. But it's the mix of the two that's involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. American Jews, for the lack of a better term, judging Israel through American values, through morals and ethics. And in that, finding a lot of things to criticize, in, in that, uh, finding a lot of reasons not to be a partisan or pro-Israel. Um, and a lot of people blaming these individuals, especially within the American Jewish community, uh, for the ongoing deterioration of the relationship. Through, I hope you don't mind me naming them, like JVP, Jewish Voices for Peace, or Jewish involvement in, in the BDS movement uh, around the country. Uh, what do you make of these voices? And in what ways they are part of the solution, part of the problem? What is their voice adding to all the categories that you have just discussed? I actually worry, Abdullah, sometimes about the other side, which is, it's Israel right or wrong. If you criticize Israel, it means you're not being loyal to Israel. It's meaning you're not helping Israel survive. And I think that whether one wants to think about it as tough love or other kinds of differences, there, there has to be room there. And I think that, you know, the you know, generation of other groups, like the ones you mentioned, um, are part of the pluralism of the, of the American Jewish community. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, it's true, it tends to be liberal on issues like human rights and stuff, but I actually don't think that, you know, I, sometimes I think it's the, uh, it's, it's, we're so concerned about Israel's enemies that we're actually willing to kind of look the other way at certain policies and practices that we might not look the other way at, you know, in our own family. Tough love is, is, is legitimate. Can you all hear Yossi? Yes. <laughs> Tough love is legitimate when the love is evident. And so I would make a distinction between a group like J Street uh, and Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, 
I don't agree with J Street on a whole range of issues, especially on the Iran deal. And, 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 uh, but J Street is part of, of a normative Jewish conversation. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, supporters of BDS, uh, to my mind, have, have placed themselves outside the confines of the community. Every community is defined by its red lines. I believe that, that in our Israel conversation, we need to have low red lines, but we still need red lines. And groups, individuals who actively support Israel's enemies, who support effectively the, the destruction of the Jewish state, uh, these are voices that have, should have no place in our communal conversation. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the question of tough and love, there needs to be, there needs to be a balance. That's a fair, fair point. And I think that you know, there, there are issues, you know, BDS can claim certain things, but I think they do, they do often fall on the side that you're talking about. But you take J Street, which was told it could not be a member of the Conference of Major Jewish right. Organizations. That's what bothers me. Right. You know, that, that's, I, I, that's, I, I that's, the, that's sort of like the Vietnam War, love it or leave it right. kind of use. Right. You also you alluded to this, but <clears throat> what do you foresee and forecast the impact of American Jewish experience and Jewish experience in Israel into Judaisms? Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a phenomenal scene when a group of Yemeni Jews uh, and the early Zionists arriving to Jaffa Gate when they meet? Mm -hmm. With a, with a sense of crisis and longing, he, he is like, here, are, here are these two Jewish communities basically meeting where they are supposed to meet, but they cannot recognize each other anymore. Well, Yemenites look at these Russians and Ukrainian Jews and the vice versa. Do you think this, if this goes this way, the current trends, American Judaisms and Judaisms in Israel will be almost unrecognizable to each other? Uh, about the long-term pluralism of Israeli society, but to understand what that means in an Israeli context, you have to dis differentiate between American Jewish pluralism and Israeli Jewish pluralism. Israeli Jewish pluralism is, is ethnically based. We have Jews from close to 100 countries, and that is reflected in a very wide diversity of Jewish experience. Uh, it is not denomina de denominationally pluralistic. And what I see happening in Israel is that there is more and more of a convergence among the different ethnic groups, uh, what we call intermarriage in Israel, marriage between Jews from Ashkenazi and Mizrahi backgrounds, uh, has become normative. Uh, when, uh, when I moved to Israel in 1982, uh, there, the, the papers would routinely report every Independence Day there'd be a release of government statistics, how many new immigrants in the previous year, how many intermarriages. And nobody bothers to keep track anymore because it's become so, so routine. And uh, the, you know, Bruce, you, you, you referred to religious secular tensions in Israel. In the early years of the state, and certainly in the formative years of the Zionist movement, uh, there, there was a struggle between what a cultural war between uh, what one can only half ironically call a war between the Israelis and the Jews. And the Israelis believed that Israel was a new departure. It was a radical break from 2,000 years of, uh, of Jewish history, culture, uh, a leap back over the diaspora to, to, to biblical times, but of course a secularized version of biblical times. Biblical times without the central element of the Bible, which was the relationship of God and the people. And so that was, secular, that was the secular Zionist vision, a new Hebrew man. And there was no place for a relationship with the diaspora, and very little place for a relationship with the Jewish identity. In the cultural war between the Israelis and the Jews, the Jews won. The Jews, that camp which believed that you cannot artificially sever thousands of years of Jewish history, that Israel is an organic continuity of all parts of Jewish history, that camp has prevailed. If you, if you listen to Israeli music today, you, 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 we were talking about this uh, before, before the, 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 the program began, uh, Israeli music today is the carrier of the re-Judaization of Israeli culture, which is astonishing because Israeli music of a previous generation was the carrier of the Hebrew secular ethos. That has been reversed now. 
The question in Israel is not whether Jewish identity, Judaism, will be a significant part of Israeli identity. It's what kind of Judaism is going to be created in Israel. And, and that is going to be a struggle for generations. Uh, there are many reasons why <coughs> religion, Judaism, has, has evolved as it has, uh, or devolved uh, as it has in Israel. Uh, there are historical, political, sociological reasons. Uh, but we are, I believe, at the beginning of a new era in the, in the place of Judaism in, uh, in Israeli identity. And, and this, is, this is the first stage of an internal Israeli struggle over what is the nature of Israeli Judaism. And there we're going to need partners with American Jewry, because this is a struggle that those of us who are for opening up the question of Judaism in Israel, who feel a sense of excitement uh, with the possibility of creating indigenous forms of Israeli Judaism that reflect uh, a, a self-confident, sovereign people, rather than the forms of Judaism that were developed in the ghetto under conditions of extreme duress and minority status. <laughs> This is, this is a possibility that, that Israel has given us. And we, until this moment, we have not taken advantage of Jewish sovereignty. You know, Zionism freed the Jewish people. It did not free Judaism. And that's the next phase. And I'm hoping to see in, in a deepening relationship between, between Israelis and American Jews on exactly this issue. If I could just say one last comment. Uh, you mentioned the controversy <laughs> over the wall. Uh, I was deeply moved by how wounded American Jews were by the, the, <coughs> by, the by, by the Israeli government's rescinding of its, of its agreement with the liberal denomination. So what moved me was that American Jews were not reacting as an alienated community, but quite the opposite. They were saying to, Israel, to, to, to the Israeli government, you have betrayed the promise of Zionism. Zionism's promise to the Jewish people was to create a public space that would reflect all parts of the Jewish people. And instead, what you have done is hand over the keys to Israel's public space to that part of the Jewish people that is least committed to the totality of the Jewish people, to the, to the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, that part of the Jewish people that was least a part of building and protecting the state. It is an anti-Zionist act on multiple levels. And so I felt that the anger and the hurt of American Jews uh, are very useful emotional, uh, um, an emotional foundation for taking us to the next step of, okay, what are we going to do about this now as partners? How do we, t how do we go to the next phase of, of, of the evolution of, of, of Judaism? He's learning about Hemets. And we were in an Israeli wedding this summer. The first two children had married a Yemenite and a Moroccan, so they had the whole Hina and everything. And this time their daughter married another Ashkenazi, but they did it. Hina, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, a little bit of cultural exchange here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I will try and keep this precise. You mentioned um, about the change going on in Israel over forms of Judaism. Do you think it is possible for indigenous forms of liberal Judaism to develop and take root? Because there's a lot of debate over why, say, Masorti is still a very much uh, The question is, I've mentioned the, the beginnings of an emergence of indigenous forms of Judaism. Uh, is it possible to, to foresee liberal forms of Judaism emerging? Uh, I think that, that, that the, the non-Orthodox forms of Judaism that are beginning to emerge in Israel uh, have some significant overlap with the liberal denominations, but there isn't a complete, uh, a complete convergence. Uh, the the emphasis on uh, on equality uh, between uh, between the genders is very much a part of this emerging uh, new new Israeli Judaism. Uh, it will be, I believe, much more traditional 
uh, the, the, than, than, than the liberal denominations uh, uh, are here. Uh, for very for very practical reason, Israelis, because of Hebrew, uh, have immediate access to the entirety of the Jewish bookshelf, and and so that creates an intimacy with with the tradition uh, that uh, that those who don't have the Hebrew have to really struggle with, and 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 other other differences as well. I think that that the I think Israeli society tends to be more traditional, more conservative, certainly much more family or fa family oriented than much of the West. And it, it's there, there are there are there are influences in Israel that will strengthen a traditional inclination, while at the same time creating a space for uh, a more contemporary form of Judaism. Um, after 50 years of occupation, why should young American Jews believe in Zionism? And my policy work to try to bring peace between the Israel and Palestinians, um, and I stand by what I said before, I think uh, that's not a concession by Israel, it's in Israel's interest. Um, I still do not think that the occupation is the only thing that defines the state of Israel. Uh, I think one has to take, in my view, most things in life, one takes you know, sort of a holistic view and tries to weigh the positive and negative. Now, one could make an argument that the occupation is so um, abhorrent to one that one will not support Israel. But I don't think it's necessarily the case. You know, I think that Israel you know, has a justification uh, for its existence and its survival. And I think both of those would be served by enemy occupation. Uh, I, I share the view there are no guarantees, uh, but I think the longer we, I always say, I don't know a lot of things that are totally true in the Middle East, but the only ones I know is what, how, as hard as things are today, they're harder tomorrow. And I've been thinking that and saying that. I was working in the State Department in 1993 when Oslo was signed, uh, when Rabin uh, decided that, recited the last stanza of the Mourner's Kaddish on the steps of the White House lawn. Uh, and uh, had said to Bill Clinton that he would shake hands with, with Arafat to make sure Arafat didn't kiss him. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's my view. And, and, and people can have, you know, have different views on that, but that, that's my, you know. In, um, in the 1980s and 90s, there was a, a widespread phenomenon uh, known as the guilty Israeli. Uh, and many of us, and I include myself in that, came out of the first intifada of the late 1980s uh, with a strong sense of, uh, of guilt, feeling that we never, we haven't offered the Palestinians an alternative to occupation. Uh, and I served in the first intifada, I served in, in Gaza, and, and I came out of that experience convinced that we need to find it another way. And I voted for Rabin, and it was, it, Rabin's election was, in 1992, was one of the, the most uh, emotional moments for me. And the second emotional moment was his assassination. But I'm no longer a guilty Israeli. And most Israelis who were guilty Israelis in the 90s no longer are. And that's one of the major differences between uh, American Jews and, uh, and Israelis today is the overwhelming majority of Israeli Jews believe two things. Uh, that one is that we tried to make peace with the Palestinian leadership and were repeatedly rebuffed. And secondly, if we were to uproot every settlement tomorrow, it would not bring us any closer to peace. Because in the end, it's not about occupation, it's about the existence of Israel in any borders. Most Israeli Jews today believe that. Now, I would add a caveat to that, which is we have tried to make peace, but the last time we really tried to make peace was in 2008, when Ehud Olmert uh, offered, uh, to, offered Mahmoud Abbas a, a virtual, complete withdrawal uh, with, with a land swap. Uh, and since 2008, we have not made a credible offer. I want to see my government make an offer. I want us to keep putting an offer on the table and for two reasons. One is, one is because 
Maybe, who knows? Maybe we'll find a partner on the other side. And the second reason is if we don't find a partner on the other side, which I really believe we will not anytime soon, then at least the onus will, will not be on us. So for both moral and practical reasons, I believe we need to continue to, to, to take the initiative in trying to make peace. But I certainly don't feel that 50 years of occupation uh, is, is entirely on us. Uh, right now, so how American Jews should become involved in issues of religious pluralism, in issues of uh, life cycle, marriage, divorce, conversion issues, um, Western Wall Tunnel, well, Western Wall, Women of the Wall. Uh, sources of financial support other than the traditional <laughs> ones that, and I can't recite them all, some of my colleagues on the rabbis probably know what they are, but there are groups like Women of the Wall and a whole variety of other groups. Uh, we, um, when we lived in Washington before we came here, our rabbi there would always tell people a whole range of different organizations if they want to do it financially. So there are many organizations one can contribute to or one can uh, provide other kinds of support, you know, for the kinds of things you believe in that would still give you a connection to Israel and that would be consistent with what you sense it your own sense of your, your own Jewish values. Uh, I would just add that the, the worst way to speak to the Israeli public is by threatening to cut off support because Israelis don't react well to threats. That's also something I think the BDS movement uh, has yet to, to learn. Israelis react in exactly the opposite way that, uh, that those who are making the threats hope they'll react to. Uh, the, the, um, the other part of this is I think that, that American Jews need to speak a different language to the Israeli public. For better or for worse, religious pluralism is not a great value among Israelis, uh, including secular Israelis. It's not, some, it's, not, it's not the same value. It doesn't hold the same space that it holds for American Jews. But if you argue to Israelis, uh, in a Zionist language, in a language of Jewish peoplehood, and say this is a, a, a mortal blow to Jewish solidarity. That's a language that Israelis understand, and that's a value that Israelis care about. And so we need to have a different language. We're, we're often speaking very different, different, different terminologies, different, different concepts. And, uh, and even though I think, I think we, 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 we often do mean the same thing. So the question was about the differences, the rift in the Obama administration between the United States and Israel, and did American Jews do enough? Um, again, I see it very differently. Again, I, the Obama administration, you know, Israel and the United States have interests that are shared and interests that are different. And where those interests were shared, the Obama administration gave Israel you know, enormous amount of supports. $38 billion over 10 years in military intelligence aid, an enormous amount of intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation. In fact, we learned a lot from the Israelis. This was not just any in terms of what they knew about how to deal with terrorism. You know, we had different views on the peace process, on peace of the Palestinians, uh, and on the nuclear non-proliferation agreement with Iran. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, and, um, you know, American Jews are very active in these issues, believe me. You know, I have a few scars on my back to, to show that. Uh, and um, so they're very active. Uh, APAC was extremely active. Uh, they were active in Congress. Uh, and, um, you know, nevertheless, um, and, you know, and there was the sense, and I've heard a lot of this, that when the new president came in, everything would be fine. I got to tell you, when I was in Israel in May, there was a little bit of buyer's remorse. Uh, we can talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States to a greater extent than at least in my lifetime. Um, we can talk about a whole variety of other things. So I actually don't don't share that analysis at all. I think the American Jewish is very active, uh, and I think the Obama administration was supportive of Israel, as an American president should be, uh, where their interests were the same. And there was a bad chemistry between the two, but again. You know, the George H.W. Bush administration had put huge pressure on Yusuf Shamir. James Baker had the famous expression, here's my phone number, call me when you're serious. Ronald Reagan sold AWACS to the Saudis over Israeli objections. 
Uh, you know, you can go all the way back. The United States was not the first to recognize the State of Israel in 1948. So when you see that in this perspective, somehow the notion that it was always total agreement before Barack Obama is just not historically true. Uh, and even now, there are plenty of disagreements, uh, you know, uh, between this administration, you know, and, and so I won't go off into this administration, but, um, but I think that, that, that that's my sense. I, I, and I think that it was, and indeed, you know, Obama got a very large share, slightly smaller, but he still got a very large share both times of the Jewish American votes being recorded. The future of Am Yisrael, the larger Jewish people, when the American um, the reform movement has patrilinear descent, when conversions done here are not accepted in Israel, and in other countries of the world, some of this may be true as well. So where do you see the future of Am Yisrael, the larger Jewish people, going when there seem to be divisions or clefts that are taking place? But my comment, and I, I do want to say this, is there was a, a question you asked that suggested that the separation between American Jewry and Israeli Jewry was based on um, different, a lot of shared values and ethics. I think that more you were trying to say it was the lack of shared experiences rather than the lack of shared ethics. Given the fact that the reform movement has uh, adopted patrilineal descent, and given that conversions that are done here by the liberal denominations are not recognized. Can everyone hear me? My yes. mic isn't working. Or even Orthodox. Uh, are, 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 not, are not accepted in Israel. Uh, are we, in effect, heading to an historic split, if I understand? Yes, the, the future of Am Yisrael. The future of the Jewish people as a, to How do you see as a totality. The, I think that, that, that Israel still plays a, a cohering role in Jewish life, and I experienced that on my, on my lecture tours. Uh, last year I spoke uh, in, um, in, in all of the major rabbinic uh, seminaries, from Yeshiva University to Chovavei Torah, which is the more liberal orthodox, to HUC, the reform movement, JTS, the conservative movement, and it was all under the auspices of APAC. And they have a program that brings together rabbinical students from across the denominations who will never meet in any other context. The Orthodox will not allow their seminary students to meet in a, in a framework with reform and conservative <laughs> rabbinical students, except in the context of, uh, of Israel. And, and when I travel around the country, I see that Israel still has the ability to bring together uh, Jewish community leaders, rabbis, however, however difficult that's becoming, it still, it still has that, that, that charismatic ability to bring together uh, parts of the Jewish community which may otherwise have almost nothing to do with each other. Now, that the the ability of Israel to 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 provide as broad a framework for Jewish peoplehood as possible is really contained enshrined in uh, in Israel's uh, law of return. The law of return, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, of the rabbinic establishment, uh, established a criterion for determining. Who is eligible for Israeli citizenship? Israel. Not on Israeli citizenship, but not on the basis of halakha. But does anyone know what the basis of Israel's law of return is? One of the grandparents. And where does that come from? The, the Nuremberg racial laws. I love saying that to non-Jewish groups as an opening. That, that Israel's the basis of Israel's immigration policy of its absorption of the Jewish people back home is the Nazi Nuremberg Law. Why? Because the founders of Israel determined that if you could be persecuted for being a Jew, Israel has the responsibility for providing you with refuge. That was very much a post-Holocaust mindset. 
the rabbis opposed it vehemently, the Orthodox rabbis, because it meant that Israel would, would absorb large numbers of immigrants under a broad rubric of, of bringing the Jewish people home, which would include many people who were not halakhically Jewish. Now, we saw that most of all playing out with the Russian immigration. Maybe a quarter or a third of the Russian immigration is not halakhically Jewish. And that's creating all kinds of, uh, as Abdullah would say, interesting issues, which is a euphemism <laughs> for, for crises. And, and so, but to my mind, that is a model of what a, a how a, a Jewish state needs to function in, in a fragmented modern reality. And, and Israel still has the ability to bring, to bring Jews together, whether literally together physically in, in the state of Israel, or, or in some broad conceptual sense in, in our relationships uh, in the diaspora. Just to echo uh, Yossi's earlier point, <clears throat> we were trying to bring some of the Muslim leadership initiative, MLI graduates, to, with a group of rabbis from a particular denomination, <laughs> And the, the difficulty was not getting together with Imams and Muslims. They had no problem shmoozing with the Muslims. But being in the same room with people from other denominations was a major, <laughs> major crime. It's amazing how similar we are. The last question goes to the gentleman, so let's make it work. Yes, freshman. Hi. Um, I often find that American Jews are very quick to criticize Israel, especially through the lens of our American liberal values. Um, and I think that like American Jews are very spoiled in the sense that like we, as you mentioned, we live in a very safe diaspora community where we don't have to necessarily fight for our survival. I'm a university student while my Israeli friends are serving the army. Um, to what extent do you think it is fair um, uh, for American Jews to um, criticize Israel? And to what extent do you think it, it, it is either helpful or detrimental to Israel and Israel's reputation for American Jews to criticize Israel? Yeah. If we take if we take Israel seriously as a project of the Jewish people, and that Israel exists simultaneously in two dimensions, it is the state of all of its citizens, and it is the homeland uh, of all Jews, whether or not they are citizens of Israel. The state of all of its citizens, whether or not those citizens are Jews, and the homeland of all Jews, whether or not they are, they are citizens of Israel. Then I think that, that the question of criticizing Israeli policies really becomes a, a function, a responsibility of, of, of this shared Jewish citizenship. I want American Jews to feel sufficiently implicated in positive and sometimes negative ways by Israel's policies to feel they have a stake in, 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 in Israel's future and that involves both support and criticism. Now that's a balance. And, and that brings us back to the question of tough love. I have, I, I, so again, I, I not only have no problem with criticism, I, I, I feel that criticism is a, is, a, is, is a responsibility of our shared Jewish citizenship. Uh, whether whether a diaspora Jews should have as, as much say as Israelis on, on the future of our security issues, on our borders, that it's obvious that the final decisions will be made by Israelis, by those who will pay the greater price. Uh, in terms of the question earlier, Marilyn, I think this was your question, of, uh, of uh, how, how far American Jews should go on issues of religious pluralism, there, American Jews, I feel, have as much a stake as Israelis do in, uh, in, in determining the, the policies of, uh, of the government that impact on our shared peoplehood. And so I, there I feel that American Jews need to take a much greater role uh, in, uh, in, in criticizing, in, in, in pressuring. Uh, that is, is, is essential. Uh, so I, 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 I see this as, as a, um, I think we need to shift the terms of the conversation. And, and the truth is that the question of whether American Jews have the right to criticize Israel, which was a big debate 
uh, when I was growing up in the 1970s in this country with Brera, those of you who remember the yeah. precursor of J Street, I think that that, that issue has been resolved and, uh, and, and American Jews uh, have, have, I believe, have won the argument. There was a poll that was just taken uh, the other day asking Israelis, do you believe American Jews have, have, should have a say in determining Israeli security policy? 50% said yes. Now, I, I have to look at that poll again because those numbers seem very high to me. I have to see how the question was formulated. But a, a very large percentage of the Israeli public is now taking diaspora Jewry seriously in a way that was not true in the previous generations. And if anything worries me today, it's that as more and more Israeli Jews begin to pay attention to the diaspora, more and more American Jews are opting out of the relationship. And, and I fear that we could be missing an historic opportunity to begin a relationship between these two essential centers of Jewish life on the basis of a, of a um, mature uh, partnership, which we've never had before. It was, Israel was always the preeminent uh, a partner and, 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 and the dominant partner. I think we have a chance on certain issues to create a real partnership uh, and to relate to each other as grown-ups, as two communities that together have a shared responsibility uh, for the Jewish future. Yeah, I think that's, I'm sure you've run into glib criticisms, you know, and we all have, but as I, as I said, I actually worry much more about the opposite, because I've run into that quite a bit, which is if you criticize Israel, it means you, you are against Israel. That's very dangerous in any setting, with any issue, with any situation, and there is fairly significant element of that in the American Jewish community, particularly politically. And I think when you have a situation where you've had, just this past week, the president of Israel, Reuben Rivlin, who's from the Likud party, heavily criticizing the state of Israeli democracy. You've had Yuval Diskin, the recently retired head of the Shin Bet, serious warnings about where the state was going. Um, we have to pay attention to those, and I think we need to do it in a way that makes, you know, that, that we're comfortable with as people and we feel is intended to contribute, you know, to making Israel, you know, in a better place, safer. But we definitely have the right to say whatever we want to say about American policy as it relates to Israel, because that's part of our citizenship here, and that's our own views. We may be right, we may be wrong, but U.S. relations with Israel should not somehow, American Jews should not feel that we can't speak on that, but we can speak on a range of other issues. And as a Muslim who has been studying Jews, Judaism, Zionism, and Israel for many years, if you take out criticism, disagreement, and debate, nothing much left there. <laughs> like we have to keep, we have to keep the, the joy of Judaism to disagree, to tear apart and debate. <laughs>